Well, Canada is about to slap some big tariffs on Chinese-made electric vehicles. After weeks of build-up, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau revealed the plans at the federal cabinet retreat in Halifax. Actors like China have chosen to give themselves an unfair advantage in the global marketplace, compromising the security of our critical, critical industries and displacing dedicated Canadian autos and metal workers. So we're taking action to address that. Effective October 1st, Ottawa will be imposing a 100% surtax on all Chinese-made EVs. And two weeks later, a 25% surtax on imports of steel and aluminum products from China that will come into effect. But these hefty taxes likely won't go without retaliation from China. Certainly, that is the big question. Ottawa says it's preparing for just that. Canada needs to be ready for all manner of reactions, and we are. But our starting point is... We have to do and we will do what the national interest, what Canadian workers require. Now, International Trade Minister Mary Ng is going to join us in a few moments. But first, Brian Kingston is the president and CEO of the Canadian Vehicle Manufacturers Association. Uh, so, Brian, thank you for making the time today. I heard from a lot of analysts on the CBC today, I think of Guy Saint-Jacques, for example, that the government really had no choice here. Certainly, this was something your group wanted. Do you think this was something they absolutely had to do today? I think they had to do it, and I think they have done the right thing by making this announcement. This automotive industry is totally integrated with the United States. It always has been and it always will be. And the success of the industry depends on continuing to align with the Americans in a range of policies, including trade policy. So as we see the Americans taking this threat from China seriously, we have to stand shoulder to shoulder with them in the approach to China, particularly as we get close to a review of our free trade agreement the Canada-United States-Mexico agreement. We cannot be offside our biggest trading partner, our strongest ally on China, because it's not just bad for the automotive industry. That will have implications for the broader Canadian economy. Now, obviously, you represent Canadian manufacturers, but what would you say to Canadians at large who question what the impact is going to be here on affordability of EVs? Well, this is a preemptive measure because there are no Chinese manufactured EVs currently sold by Chinese manufacturers in this country. And I will just jump in here for the audience. Uh, some Teslas are manufactured that's in, correct. in Shanghai right now, but obviously that's not a Chinese brand. Yes, that's exactly correct. Um, so it doesn't have an immediate impact on the existing market. This is preempting so that we get ahead of what we've seen, for example, in Europe, where Chinese manufacturers have gained massive market share in a very short period of time. Does it not have a potential to have an impact on the existing market, given that some of the cars being sold right now are from China and would be hit by this tax? No, because what we're seeing right now is we're in the early stages of a transition, but we've gone from three EVs in 2012 in the Canadian market to over 80 now in virtually every size and segment. So the vehicles are here, but the industry does need more time time to allow these major investments, $40 billion in counting in Canada, to actually achieve their economies of scale. And so today's announcement will buy that time and allow us to have more of these vehicles in market and ultimately the prices to come to more comparable to a gas-powered vehicle. Okay, I, I am just going to stick on this point for one second because I know that part of the argument has been that the uh, portion of Chinese manufactured vehicles in Canada is ramping up super, something like $2.2 billion of the market. So surely it will have some impact, even if it's not an enormous one, on the existing market? I don't see an immediate impact on the market simply because we don't have significant volumes of these vehicles being sold. I think the bigger impact will be, can we get our supply chain up and running in the time required? Remember, the federal government has mandated 100% EV sales by 2035. That is a very steep climb, and a lot needs to happen in the next 11 years to make that uh, a possibility. We need to have mines approved. We have to build charging infrastructure. We have to give these facilities time to ramp up production and come online. I was just in Windsor a couple of weeks ago and saw this phenomenal battery plant which is being built. So the footprint has been laid, but it does take time. This won't happen overnight, and that's why the announcement today was so important. Some of those steps you're talking about, though, is that a further role for the government if we're talking about more charging stations, for instance, or incentives to make these cars more affordable? Yeah, I think the biggest role for government right now is really in the charging infrastructure side of things. I mean, we've seen the targets that have been established by Environment Canada. They are very ambitious, and frankly, at this point, they're just unachievable. Enercan is estimating that we need to have 40,000 public chargers built every single year 
from 2025 to 2035. That is a very steep climb. I don't see any evidence that we're building at the speed required. So that's a place where government has to play a role to make sure that Canadians, who understandably want to make sure that the switch is going to be convenient, they need to know the infrastructure is going to be there for them. What do you say to somebody who is listening to this and they're thinking, okay, vehicle manufacturers just got enormous investments, be it in batteries or the plants themselves. This could lead to, I mean, it's a worst case scenario, but a trade war with China. And you're also saying, oh, and by the way, we need further tax dollars to complete uh, this change. You so say you're just asking for too much. Yeah, well, I would say whatever we do, let's not undermine this industry that we have invested so much in. The automotive sector is responsible for our second largest goods export to the United States and more uh, and globally. This is a huge industry. It's just pivotal to the Canadian economy that it remains strong. So it would be the definition of economic insanity, frankly, if after supporting this transition, investing in these facilities, we turned around and said, oh, and by the way, we're now going to allow these heavily subsidized vehicles into the market. That would be a very bad approach, particularly given how aligned and integrated we are with the U.S. economy. I talked about the prospect of pushback. I mean, how likely do you think it is that another sector in Canada, for instance, might see retaliation? In the past, we think of uh, what happened with um, canola or uh, pork on different issues. It's always a risk when you take any sort of trade action that there could be a, a retaliatory measure. Um, but I think we have to look at, at the bigger picture here. The Canadian economy is and always will be tied to the United States. And that's really uh, a factor of geography. We happen to sit beside the most dynamic and wealthiest country in the world. So despite all of the efforts and valiant efforts that have been made by successive governments to diversify trade, we will always depend on the United States. So yes, there is a risk of retaliation, but it is clear where our prosperity lies, and that is with the US. On that note, then, how concerned are you about the prospect of another Trump presidency? Because he's obviously going to take a very different approach to this than Joe Biden. Yeah, well, if there's one thing that uh, we see consensus on in the United States across party lines, it's China. Um, mm -hmm. So I think Canada taking uh, an approach that aligns with the American approach is frankly going to be very smart. There will be a question with respect to the pace of the EV transition and some of the major investments that the U.S. has announced through things like the Inflation Reduction Act. So we obviously have to keep an eye on that. Uh, but at the end of the day, if we don't have an aligned set of policies with the U.S., we will have a hard time winning and maintaining the investment we have in this country. I feel like keep an eye on that is a very polite way of talking about something that really could be, I mean, is a Trump presidency not the potential for the table to be totally flipped for, for the industry? No, not necessarily. Um, if you look at the standards that have been put forward and the EV targets that have been established by the Biden administration, these are long-term targets. I think that those will remain in force, even if you have a, a change of administration. Where you have question marks is things like charging infrastructure. The Biden administration has put a lot of money behind that. Could you say, see a change? Perhaps. But at the end of the day, you've got to look at where is industry putting its money. $1.2 trillion has gone into electrification. Regardless of who's in power, this is the path forward. The only question mark is the pace with which we can achieve these targets. Okay. Well, thank you very much for bringing us your perspective today. I appreciate it. Brian Kingston is the CEO of the Canadian Vehicle Manufacturers Association. Well... Joining us now from the Cabinet Retreat in Halifax, International Trade Minister Mary Ng. Minister Ng, thank you very much for making time for the program today. Hi, Catherine. Very good to talk to you. I want to start with one of the last topics we were talking about with Mr. Kingston, which is the idea of retaliation from China. Um, what, what are you hearing? What have you heard thus far about the prospect of retaliation? Well, let's start with uh, what we did today, which is um, putting forward tariffs on um, on EVs uh, made in China that has a very intentional policy of overcapacity. And uh, Canada is not the only country that has responded. Um, other uh, trading partners of Canada has also done so. And uh, with respect to overcapacity, uh, the issue of overcapacity on steel and aluminum has been something not just Canada uh, has been tackling and dealing with, um, but, uh, but we have been doing that with our G7 partners as well. So what we've done today is uh, standing up for Canadian workers and for Canadian businesses, particularly in the electric vehicle space, but very, very consistent with what we have been doing as a country, standing up for our workers and uh, this industry. So you've given us a lot of threads to pull on there, but I want to go back to the question I asked you in the first place. I appreciate you want to make the case for what you're doing. Have you heard any response from Chinese officials since you made this move? No. 
Okay. It's my understanding, I saw a reference in the Globe and Mail to you having discussions with Beijing last month. Was there any effort to uh, discourage Canada from taking this path? No, I mean, the work we did uh, was uh, to talk to Canadian industry, and uh, we've certainly done that from auto parts to uh, the automobile makers, steel and aluminum uh, makers, and uh, the workers. And, uh, and the decision was very much informed by our consultations with the Canadian businesses and the Canadian workers. And, uh, and this is uh, the right decision uh, for us um, uh, today. Why not go further today? We know the U.S. looked at solar panels, semiconductors. The Conservatives were out today suggesting that you ought to have gone further. Why not have made that announcement today? Well, we've been talking to um, industries, as, uh, as I said, over the last uh, 30, you know, 40, 30, well, about 30, 45 days. And, uh, and what you're seeing here in today's announcement is that we're going to take another 30 days to talk uh, to industry a little bit more about solar panels and semiconductors, battery, battery parts. So that work is continuing. Uh, you always want to make sure that when you are doing this, that you are getting it right. Um, and, uh, and that's what we're doing. So we're going to take just a little bit more time, another uh, quick 30 days to do that um, with, uh, with Canadian industry and, uh, and our workers and stakeholders. Why, why was that part of this more complicated? Because as you say, you were already consulting. Why did you need 30 days more for the, these add-on elements? <laughs> We did these consultations uh, as quickly as we did and in a focused way for electric vehicles and for steel and aluminum and, uh, and, and this additional work with respect to the parts and to semiconductors uh, and solars just needs a little bit more time for us to talk to uh, the industries and, uh, and, and they appreciate that. They, they want us to do that. Um, Minister Freeland, when she first raised the prospect of Canada following suit with the Americans and to some extent the European Union as well, did talk about the issue of security. To what extent have, um, has the Canadian government made a determination about whether or not electric vehicles constitute a security risk in terms of the amount of information that's being collected about users? Well, that was certainly a part of this consultation. and That work, um, we've gotten feedback on that, and we are in the midst of um, of considering it, and uh, we'll have more to say once we've done that work. But how, on how concerned are you, Minister? Security. So I do think it's a pressing issue. Well, like, I appreciate the, the full analysis isn't done yet, but you, you, you'd be privy to some of this information. How worried are you? Well, I mean, um, electric vehicles uh, do drive around as a, uh, you know, as a computer, and there is data that is collected. There is privacy concerns that uh, that I know Canadians want us to be thoughtful about. So that is exactly what uh, you know we had been talking to stakeholders about in the course of this consultation. That's what we're looking at, and uh, and we'll have certainly more to say about that uh, once we have an opportunity to, um, you know, to uh, to. Uh, to reflect on that work uh, more uh, more thoroughly, but absolutely, I mean, it's an issue that uh, that is of concern to to Canadians and uh, and to uh, to essentially computers that are you know running on our um, you know on our data system here in Canada through uh, through uh, through those particular systems. So um, so certainly that was why it was part of the consultation, and uh, and we will for sure have more to say about that. The Americans are looking at this issue closely as well, and I've even heard it suggested that if their findings are dramatic enough, they would ban these vehicles entirely rather than simply slapping on major tariffs. Is that something that you could see in the future for Canada? Well, the industry of automobile making between Canada and the United States is extremely integrated. I think that, uh, you know, I used to use a statistic, which is that a car being made here in North America crosses our borders somewhere in the order of, you know, 78 times in doing so. That's how integrated uh, we are. And, uh, and, and, you know, today's uh, decision was very much about protecting the EV sector that is growing and, uh, and and certainly also it's not just the EV sector I mean we're talking about critical minerals as well that Canada has uh, has all of the all of the critical minerals necessary uh, for the creation of batteries um, and uh, and all of the products and many of the products that we're going to need to uh, propel our green future so uh, so this work is uh, you know this work is important for us to uh, uh, to you know to to protect this industry and these workers uh, right here in Canada. You talk about our green future. Certainly some environmental groups have raised questions about uh, making EVs more affordable and how this might create a challenge on that front. What would you say to them? 
I would say that Canada makes decisions uh, in fighting climate change as we have standing up for Canadian workers and this industry. We know that the standards that China has employed in making their vehicles have standards for labor as well as for uh, for the environment. Um, that uh, you know that uh, that are not comparable to ours at all, uh, and uh, and for us here in Canada, it's about fighting climate change and it's about building uh, electric vehicles uh, that are clean and that's going to fight climate change uh, now and into the future. But do you think it will affect vehicle affordability in this country? The fact that, for instance, uh, Tesla vehicles that are made in Shanghai would presumably at this moment be subject to these tariffs. I think Canadians uh, want to fight climate change. I think Canadians care about affordability. I think Canadians want green vehicles. And I think Canadians are proud, and certainly those communities that actually have investments now in them to build these cars are seeing those very good paying jobs that are going to propel generations of workers, whether it's in electric vehicles, whether it's in that supply chain, whether it's in critical minerals, or whether it's in steel and aluminum. That's uh, what I've been hearing directly from Canadians. Uh, before I let you go, I do want to ask you about the state of your party. Uh, is Justin Trudeau still the best person to lead the Liberals? He absolutely is. Has all my confidence. Despite what your party saw in Toronto, St. Paul's, despite the fact that some members of your own uh, caucus are suggesting that perhaps the time has come or even passed uh, for him to step aside. Well, as I said, I've got confidence in the Prime Minister and the work that we are doing is over the summer has been listening to Canadians as we said we would. And here are the things that Canadians uh, are talking to us about. Uh, help us with, uh, you know, to make life a little bit more affordable. Get those homes built. Make sure that our economy has great jobs for Canadians. And I can tell you we've been here uh, at the Cabinet retreat and that is the work that we are working hard on behalf of Canadians to do. So is the message, Minister Ng, then essentially at this point steady as she goes or do you folks need to offer some kind of signal to Canadians that there is a big change afoot, that you've heard their discontent? We've been listening to Canadians, and uh, as I said earlier, the work that they want us to focus on, make life a little bit more affordable, um, build those homes and uh, keep working on making sure that our economy has those good jobs for Canadians. And in fact, today's, a, you know, today's decision around, uh, around tariffs uh, for electric vehicles and the growing out of that, uh, of that particular industry to which we have made investment choices about uh, is very much about doing exactly that. But, so then it sounds to me like you're saying you're sticking to the course. We shouldn't expect any kind of um, major new policy or anything like that to show Canadians that there's a real shift. You're just, what, putting your nose to the grindstone and hoping to leave Toronto-St. Paul behind you? We're working very hard for Canadians. I do that every single day, wake up every single day to do that, and today is no different, and we've been doing that uh, uh, with my Cabinet colleagues, with the Prime Minister at, uh, at Cabinet uh, today, and we'll be here tomorrow doing exactly that. And do you believe that that approach can bring you back up in the polls? I think Canadians are going to, uh, um, you know, I think Canadians expect us to do the work that we have been listening to them over the course of the summer to do, and, um, and we're going to stay very, very focused on Canadians. Okay. Minister Ng, thank you for making time for the program. Uh, appreciate it. Thanks so much. Thanks, Catherine.